First, I'd like to uh, set the stage for this presentation describing what took place at the World's Fair 117 years ago. Let's go back to Saturday, June 17, 1904. It was a Friday. The fair had been open for six weeks and nearly all exhibits were installed and the concessions on the pike were all open. The Globe Democrat reported that St. Louis hotels were doubling or even tripling their house detectives. They were concerned about the possibility of crooks and thieves coming to town to take advantage of all the visitors coming to see the fair. Over 50,000 Iowans traveled to St. Louis to participate in Iowa Day. Governor A. B. Cummins dedicated the building, which was the first state building to be completed. It combined features of the old and new Iowa State Capitol buildings in Des Moines. A great pipe, pipe organ in the Iowa building served for many fair recitals prior to the completion of the large organ in Festival Hall. The ceremonies and parade ended at 9.30 a.m. on the Colonnade of States at the Iowa statue, which was dedicated and accepted by the LPE company. A famous congressman and 1900 Democratic presidential candidate, William Jennings Bryan visited the fair. When he got to the gate, a guard refused to admit him because his pass was not properly signed. Once he was admitted, he strolled the pike with a friend of his, the Wyoming governor, Fenimore Chatterton. And finally, today is really special. At noon today, the great floral clock began operating. The 112 foot diameter clock was built on a hillside at the north end of the Palace of Agriculture. 13,000 plants were planted to cover the entire face of the clock and form the numbers. The 55 foot minute hand weighed 2,500 pounds and the tip of it was triggered to move six feet when it was triggered by the clock's masterworks. And all of us members know that the masterworks were owned by, acquired and owned by the World's Fair Society and are currently on display at the Missouri History Museum. So now it's time for our presentation. I'd like to first tell you a little bit about myself and then uh, have Holly tell a little bit about herself. I retired from a career in the Air Force where I, where I flew planes and managed computer programs. I came to St. Louis in 1989 and worked for the Air Force here at Scott Air Force Base as a contractor until I re retired just a couple of years ago. I discovered and joined the society in 1996 and I have the honor of serving members as the society president. Holly, do you want to uh, chip in with a few words? I didn't have a prepared message like you. <laughs> uh, I've been a part of the 1904 World's Fair Society since 2017. Uh, I've been uh, on the board as the Director of Exploitation since 2018. Um, I've worked at the Art Museum since 2012, and um, I'm a fan of all kinds of World's Fairs. I enjoy reading about them. She does a great job with Instagram and sending the notices out and kind of helping to keep our roster straightened out. So before we get started, as a final reminder, if you have any questions, uh, please enter them into uh, the Zoom chat window. And I want to capture a, uh, a picture of everyone. Uh, let's see, where's the uh, screen capture? And screen, there it is. Mike, I've been doing them too, so. Okay, good. <laughs> um, I know Cher will not be here. She's down in Florida with her son who's uh, scheduling probably some surgery. But uh, let's see, I'm going to take control of the screen and switch over to PowerPoint. And you should see, everyone should see my uh, PowerPoint screen, and I'm going to go to full screen mode. And we'll get uh, started with the presentation. There it goes. Okay, a trip to the pike. Hopefully everyone can see the screen. If not, unmute yourself and uh, yell at us. As the 20th century began, America was undergoing a major and rapid transformation. 
the largely rural America with most of the population in farming was becoming an industrialized society with large cities and manufacturing centers. Along with these changes came an increase in available time that Americans had for entertainment. In the late 1800s, the Eastern cities had movies, museums, and even big entertainment parks such as Coney Island. But the rest of America, entertainment often traveled to the audience. Circuses, large and small, traveled the country by train, setting up in fields near towns for a few days of performances. Wild West shows also traveled across America and even went to Europe. Buffalo Bill and Frederick T. Cummins put on the largest cowboy and Indian extravaganzas traveling across the US and Europe, celebrating the vanishing frontier of America's West. But another type of entertainment also captured the attention of America. The Victorian era World's Fairs displayed the products, culture, and art from countries around the world. This picture is the cover of a dedication day program from April 30th, 1903, which President Theodore Roosevelt and former President Grover Cleveland both attended. The Victorian World's Fairs had large and fanciful exhibit buildings. They marketed new farming products, inventions, manufactured goods, and provided a vast array of entertainment to millions of fair visitors in Europe and America, as you can see. They were quite often timed to celebrate uh, special events, um, such as the discovery of America in Chicago, 1893, uh, Lewis and Clark, the founding of Jamestown. Um, Paris and uh, London also had major world's fairs. But the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair epitomized these trends of showing off the new and latest products. And particularly on the Pike, where even some countries' exhibits were organized into entertainment shows. Fair President David R. Francis, the former mayor, governor, Secretary of the Interior had traveled tirelessly to bring a World's Fair to St. Louis. The fair organizers built a fair so magnificent that many writers found themselves at a loss for words trying to describe what they saw. One man called it indescribably grand in his diary. Filling nearly two square miles, including the western half of Forest Park, it stretched west into all the way to what is today Big Bend Avenue. Pike performers were featured as part of the opening day parade on April 30th, 1904, along with people from countries around the world. Francis and the fair's organizers wanted the entertainment attractions to not undermine the fair's overall standards and educational mission. They regulated and controlled the attractions to minimize the tastelessness and sensationalism of the sideshow. The Pike even celebrated music from polkas to marches. The St. Louis Fair's Pike was the most expensive amusement section ever constructed for an exposition. The mile long Pike contained some 50 shows and attractions and also extended to the south towards the top of this slide along Skinker. The main pike was paved with brick, 90 feet wide and illuminated with arc lights at night. It stayed open until around 11 p.m. Nicknamed the $10 million pike, a piker could see 1,500 exotic animals, sample food from around the world, and be entertained by about 6,000 performers. So let's follow a fictional family on their first real trip to the Pike through the eyes of their oldest child, Laura. Parents Joseph and Dorothy are taking their children out for the big day. Laura is 17, her brother Tom is 15, and Elizabeth, who they call Betty, was eight years old. And they had all been to the fair before and seen some of the exhibit palaces. They had been saving their nickels and dimes for, for this trip since Christmas, and now school is out for the summer. It's the middle of June, 1904, and it's Laura's first big trip to the Pike. As we follow this family on a trip to the Pike on the slides, a yellow star will show on a map at the bottom of most of the slides to show their location on the Pike. Oh, oh. Okay. 
We've been waiting for this trip for months, since before the fair even opened. Dad already took us to the fair a couple of times, and we also went on one short school trip to the fair. On those trips, we mainly looked at the magnificent palaces and a lot of their exhibits. That was interesting and educational, I know. But today, we're finally going to the fair for a fun day on the pike. We planned our trip to the pike in detail, down to the path and main attractions we want to see. Once inside the gate, we are going to pass the Palace of Manufacturers on our way to the Louisiana Purchase Monument. Then we will pass the Palace of Electricity, Palace of Varied Industries, in Japan on our way to the observation wheel. After riding the Ferris wheel, we will pass by New York to the North Pole on our way to the Pike. We've heard all about the Pike from our friends and read about Pike Day, which was a couple of weeks ago on June 4th. The parade of Pike people and the fireworks must have been something, even if it was delayed by a thunderstorm. We were told that the parade had a Chinese dragon 100 feet in length that required 50 men to operate it. We got up early today and ate a quick breakfast before leaving. After taking a few streetcars to the fair's main entrance and paying our admission, 50 cents for adults, 25 cents for children, we go through the newfangled turnstiles. We look at the great statue of St. Louis which is made of staff, just like the palaces. We briefly stop to look around the 100 foot tall Louisiana Purchase Monument, where dad saw the opening day ceremonies on April 30th. We look at the large statues overlooking the Grand Basin, depicting harsh scenes on the frontier not so long ago. As we walk past the nearby palaces, we're amazed at their size. They're taller than the biggest trees. And though they look like stone buildings, we know that they're made of staff and will be destroyed when the fair is over. We stop and gaze for a bit at Festival Hall and the Cascades that's at the top of Art Hill, overlooking the Grand Basin. On our next trip to the fair, we'll go to an organ concert in Festival Hall. And someday when we have more time, We'll go for a 10 cent gondola or launch ride on the Grand Basin, but today's the day for the pike. We're now ready to do what we want to do most. We head for the giant observation wheel that just opened about two weeks ago on May 28th. We've been told that from the top of the enormous Ferris wheel, you could see the entire fairgrounds and perhaps even all the way to downtown. It costs 50 cents for adults as much of the admission price, but you get two trips around the wheel and go 264 feet high in the wheels cars, which are as big as small trolley cars, 13 feet by 26 feet. I've even heard that they have weddings and fancy dinners in these cars. I can believe it. On the way up, our car isn't too crowded, so we can look around. We're amazed at all the steel girders and rods that make this gigantic ride possible. The palace stretches out before us like buildings in a dream, all the way to Festival Hall. As we go higher, the Japanese garden buildings right below us begin to look like little toy houses. From the top, we can see for miles and miles. Over to Washington University, the foreign buildings and University City, including E.G. Lewis's women's magazine building. We can see across to the pike where all the neat attractions are and even some buildings way over in St. Louis. The view is fantastic and a bit scary too. There's the Palace of Agriculture. Coming down for the last time, we can see the giant floral clock to the west. It is sad to see the ride end, but it was a thrill. Leaving the wheel, we head to the main part of the pike. We hear the sounds of Boer War behind us. With the fake gunfire from 600 soldiers who recreate the great battles of the Boer War in South Africa that ended not too long ago in 1902, but we have more fun things to see and do. 
On the way to the main part of the pike, we pause and take a look at an attractive ride that promises a realistic voyage from New York to the North Pole on a 200 foot ship called the Discoverer, complete with chilled, cooled air. Visitors are transported from New York Harbor to the North Pole in 20 minutes. We heard that even the ship was lit up at night. This is a ride that we might come back to later. As we finally enter the west end of the pike, we're surrounded by several of the pike's largest attractions. One magazine reporter described the pike as, You look up a broad paved highway lined from beginning to end with bizarre looking edifices lined with a dense crowd. You see and hear a babble of strange tongues, the sound of unfamiliar instruments, the noise of many bands, the roar of animals from many climes, the voice of the barkers hawking the various entertainments, the tramp of countless feet and the indescribable din that only thousands of people hastily thrown together from all parts of the globe could make. Marshall Everett, The Book of the Fair. At each of the major attractions on the pike has a crowd in front listening to the cry of the barker. A newspaper article had described their spiel as, Listen to his convincing logic, his masterful argument, his glowing eloquence and seductive, alluring invitation to witness the best show on the grounds. Somehow we have fallen under the influence and we find ourselves drifting to the sphere of his influence. It is worth the price of admission to hear this Pike orator. Marshall Everett, The Book of the Fair. We look around and consider seeing the Galveston flood attraction where the great disaster of 1900 was recreated. That city suffered 6,000 deaths from a hurricane. It was the worst catastrophe ever for an American city but perhaps another day. We also pass on Hale's Firefighters. It is a very large building that has displays of historic and current fire equipment and is named for a former Kansas City fire chief. Inside, firemen fight a six-story blazing building and rescue people in New York City at night. The Barker says the brave firemen are even ready to fight fires on the fairgrounds, should one occur. We all agreed to see Boyton's naval exhibit. This show of a famous naval battle is in a huge water basin. It is the same size as the football field that my brother Tom plays on, about 300 feet long by 160 feet wide. In this miniature ocean, about 20 man model ships up to 21 feet long fire actual shells at each other and at the shore. The Barker said we'd hear about 20,000 shots, but I couldn't count that much that fast. We saw battles from the Spanish-American War of 1898, including the attempt of the Spanish ships to run the blockade at the Battle of Santiago Bay. The boats are operated by people inside of them, controlling electric motors and firing the guns. I heard a story that one day, one of the model ships caught fire and sprung a leak. The crowd thought it was all part of the show, but it nearly sank and almost drowned the operator. Next, Dad takes us to the Battle Abbey, which looks like a medieval castle, but inside it's an American war museum. It has several large displays called cycloramas of famous American battles, lots of war relics and weapons. The guides are in Civil War uniforms of both the North and South. Just as we learned in school, we see recreations of famous American battles such as Yorktown, New Orleans, Manassas, and Custer's Massacre. But the Battle of Gettysburg display is the most impressive. It is 50 feet high and 400 feet in circumference. You can't help but feel for the suffering and sacrifice of those that fell in battle just 40 years ago. After leaving the Battle Abbey, it's now time for a quick lunch. We get some sandwiches from Shoot the Shoots restaurant. We watch people get into large boats. First, they're dragged up a ramp, 
then slide quickly down a water flume into a large pool. They make a gigantic splash at the bottom and get everyone very wet. Betty eats quickly and goes down to watch. She came back soaking wet, like she was out in the rain, but she drives off quickly. There's a lot of booths selling fair souvenirs here, but we'll buy our souvenirs later, as we've still got all afternoon to spend on the pike. Right next door is the Scenic Railway, which is also a roller coaster. Tom and I spend 15 cents to go on a three mile ride that takes just a few minutes while the rest of the family looks around. The railway tracks go outside the fairgrounds over bridges, torrents, tunnels, and past scenes of glaciers, Jerusalem, Iceland, Pompeii, and South Sea Islands. But the real thrill is near the end, as one girl from Kansas wrote in her diary. I knew it was a ride in cars going up and down, but I never realized what a feeling it sent over a person. Anyhow, we got on and the man hollered, hold on to your hats and tight to your purses. Someone else would holler, just wait until the hills come. The first hill was not so bad, but the rest, why, I just couldn't sit still and not give my breath up. I tell you, it was a hard problem to solve. Lillian Schumacher, a Wichita girl, goes to the fair. After this excitement, we decided to take it easy for a bit and just look at some of the concessions with the rest of the family. We skip the boat trip into the magic whirlpool, even though it's only 15 cents. From the entrance, we can see a circular cascade 80 feet in diameter that falls 30 feet. In the center is an electric fountain that rises up 60 feet above the floor. We've heard there's an enchanted lake 60 feet above the ground floor. Visitors get there by boats gliding over the surface. The boats are swept over the circular waterfall, swinging six times around its circuit beneath descending waters. Afterwards, the boat shoots into a submarine channel past tropical gardens. The smartest horse in America, Jim Key, was right here on the pike. The spieler claimed that this horse could read, write, spell, answer math questions, run a post office, perform shopping chores, and answer Bible questions. We paid 50 cents for the half hour show. We wonder if Jim Key was being signaled by his trainer or if he really was smarter than my eight-year-old sister, Betty. We are truly amazed. The show also urges us to treat animals humanely. Nearby, we see several more attractions that beckon us to visit faraway lands, such as the Chinese village with magicians and a bazaar where you could find silk weavers and carvers, a restaurant and a tea house. The American Indian cliff dwellers of the Southwestern US with their strange multi-level houses has in the center of the Pueblo village is a theater where native dances are performed. Also, the cliff dwellers have pottery, weaving, and blanket and basket making is exhibited. The Barker at Alaska's Eskimo village nearly enticed us in. It looked like a gigantic iceberg. He said we could see dog sleds, glaciers, totem poles, and igloos that we could pan for gold and that one of the Eskimo children was Nancy Columbia, who was born at the Chicago Fair of 1893 and was now at her third World Fair. But we decide to see the streets of Cairo for 25 cents. It's a large and impressive attraction and the Barker puts us under his spell of words, telling us that this exhibit is bigger than the Egyptian exhibit at the Chicago Fair, with 26 buildings, 67 sales booths, and many other entertainments. When we get inside, we see lots of camels, donkeys, monkeys, snake charmers, street musicians, and entertainers all over the place. We spend quite a while just looking around at the people, but avoiding being taken in by any of the vendors. A trained monkey entertains us a few minutes. He keeps the nickel that dad threw at him, but threw back our copper pennies. 
When we leave Cairo, we take a minute to look around. It seems that we've traveled a long, long way from St. Louis since this morning with all the foreign buildings, voices, smells, and hundreds of people. They're from all over the world, dressed in strange clothes, talking in foreign languages. But it all seems so normal here on the Pike. We even heard that many of the performers live on the Pike for weeks or months at a time. We went to the baby incubators that are protecting the lives of many tiny babies. We learned in school that being sanitary around babies make them healthier and more likely to survive an early birth. We next pick a small ride to go on right next door. Mom, Dad, and Betty go on the Golden Chariot, which was one of the most beautiful merry-go-rounds I have ever Annie. saw. Hey, Annie. Annie. Did we lose your holly? Oh, I, I didn't know if you were lost. Okay. Um, okay, the girl from Wichita said, my, what a feeling passed over me on the circle swing. We went on it and talk about flying. Well, I never in all my life was on such a high pedestal as I was then, but we all got out safe and sound. Lillian Schumacher. We see the deep sea divers attraction with a giant tank of water with undersea rescues. We pass on the Siberian railway, taking a trip down, trip all the way across Russia because it didn't interest us very much. We saw cowboys and Indians outside of Frederick T. Cummins Wild West show. It had famous Indian chiefs, Indians from 51 tribes in Calvary, and mounted armies, armies from around the world. The Congress of Rough Riders performed stage exhibitions of frontier battles. Dad thought this was a bit violent for us city folks, and it was a long show, so we didn't much mind not seeing it, since there were so many more things that we wanted to see. Now there are two neat attractions right across from each other, and we can't decide which to see. Mom really wants to see the Palais du Costume, and the rest of us want to see creation. So Mom takes Betty with her, and we split for an hour. We plan to meet afterwards at the next restaurant for a snack and to share stories. We've heard that Rodler's creation is the best attraction on the pike, and expensive too. 50 cents adults, 25 cents for children. It has a large blue dome and a great statue at the entrance. The Barker said we would see the earthly works of God, a journey to ancient lands, and finally the six days of the creation of the world. I was a bit skeptical, but my friends said this was such a neat ride that I just had to see it for myself. The Barker said that the grand entrance was just like the attraction at Coney Island. After paying our admission, we get into a boat and take a trip around the inside of the dome. We float past pictures of the Grand Canyon, of the Colorado River, Yosemite Park, Alaska, and then went backwards in time through forests, volcanoes to prehistoric times and saw primeval man. Then we get out, descend some stairs, and see various illusions such as living, talking heads without bodies. After another boat ride through a labyrinth, we float by ancient countries and cities, Egypt, Assyria, Greece, Rome, China, Japan, France, and England. After that journey, we climb some stairs up to a platform and see the six days of the creation of the world. We see the earth being formed, the waters and dry lands, the trees and grass, the sun, moon and stars, birds and fish, and finally, man and woman created in Eden. It was all quite fascinating. When we met mom and Betty for our snack at the restaurant, they tell us about the Palais de Costume. They saw 30 scenes of fashion from ancient Rome to the present. 
complete with period furnishings and costumes. They even saw Napoleon watching Josephine on the eve of coronation a hundred years ago. And mom says she loves seeing the last display of the latest fashions from the most famous Paris designers and even the new hairstyles. Leaving the restaurant at Old St. Louis, there are several more attractions of lands near and far that we don't have time for right now, including Old St. Louis, which recreated the village of St. Louis 1803 when the Louisiana Purchase was made with forts, stockades, bands, and an arena for displays of skilled horsemanship, dangerous high wire acts, and other feats of skill. Paris and the French village shows this culture at its most fun. Paris's Café Chantant was a vaudeville theater with continuous performances by dancers, acrobats, and comedians. Fair Japan looks very interesting. Its large entrance pagoda was a replica of the Temple of Nikko Gate from 80 miles from Tokyo. The Barker talked of skilled acrobats, the bazaar, the Imperial Gardens of Mikado, and Geisha Girls. We even heard the Barker talk about the spider dance where the dancers wove strings all over the stage, but we're eager to move on. On a historical note, after the fair, the entrance pagoda to Fair Japan was moved to Forest Park Highlands Amusement Park on Oakland Avenue, where it was used as a bandstand. At the Highlands, it had red columns and was outfitted with many electric lights. This remnant of the fair was replaced in 1939 by a less ornate pavilion. That pavilion burned down in the 1963 fire that destroyed most of the highlands. It is now the site of the Forest Park Community College. But back to Laura and her family. We also talk about seeing the hereafter, which claims to show a vision of two worlds, heaven and Hades. The Barker said we'd see a descent into Hades complete with fire, tortured in heavens, and Satan himself. We heard stories that Satan was so scary that children confessed their sins and lies. Then after crossing the river of death in Sharon's boat, we would pass through solid rock to see heaven. But after seeing creation, we were unconvinced this could be any better. We decided to stop and see the decanatal glass blowers at the glass weavers building. We make our way through the crowd to watch men and women putting glass decorations on heads and pins, blowing vases and spinning glasses, which consisted of heating a bar of glass that made an almost invisible thread like cobweb. This thread is drawn from the heated bar and ran over a wheel about six feet in diameter at the rate of a mile a minute. These glass threads are then mixed with silk about one silk strand to 10 glass strands, then woven into a cloth-like fabric. We see glass ribbons and beautiful dresses made out of glass. We leave the glass weavers to head to something we have heard a lot about. Hagenbach Zoo, Circus and Animal Paradise is one of the most popular attractions at the fair. After we pay the 10 cents emission fee, we see the baby elephant that was born on a ship on the way to the fair. This mm. is different from most zoos, which display animals in cages. Hagenbeck has open air display of wild animals from all around the world. For only 10 cents, we could take ride on tortoises, elephants, camels, ostriches, or zebras. We even saw elephants that went down a slide into the pool. Dad pays for us to go into the arena and see the trained wild animal show in a 3,000 seat theater. A national magazine told this story about the lion show. You will find four distinguished and defiant denizens of the desert placed on stools and under the control of the eye, whip and pistol and above all the nerve of a pretty woman. When the four lions are comfortably seated, the pretty figure begins to pirouette around the circle. And as each lion is approached, the light foot of the dancer is thrown into the air so dangerously near the jaws that the spe spectators visibly shudder. 
Again, the dainty foot is thrown into the air and withdrawn so instantaneously as to barely save it from mangling by the powerful jaws that launch out savagely. This time the lion suddenly reaches out his head and snaps his jaws not two inches from the foot. The clever woman cracks her whip determinedly in the animal's face and moves on to the next lion. John Brisbane Walker, Cosmopolitan Magazine, September 1904. After seeing the wild animal show at Hagenbeck's, the sun is getting lower. The lights are coming on and they illuminate all the attractions. It seems like we, in a world far from St. Louis, the pike is getting more crowded since the palaces are closing. And as one person said, The din of cowbells, whistles, megaphones, the infernal yelling of the barkers mingled with the boom of cannon rendered a pandemonium that I don't expect to hear again this size of, Hade, of Hades. Sam Hyde, Thanksgiving Night on the Pike from Martha Clevenger's Indescribably Grand. Now the Temple of Mirth loudly beckons to us with riotous sounds of laughter coming from within. We're told it has a glass and mirrored maze, curved mirrors made, making other funny and exciting areas and ends in a circular slide called Helter Skelter. The Barker makes it sound nearly irresistible, but we save our dwindling money. We bypass the shooting gallery of hunting in the Ozarks that reproduced a portion of the Ozark Mountains and other small attractions. We have no time for the ostrich farm that has 60 birds brought from a Southern California ranch. Are the streets of Seville, which entrance was a reproduction of the Plaza de Toros with Spanish dancers, model bullfighters, and Spanish fashions in The Girl from Madrid. Mysterious Asia looks interesting, and we get a drink from the free water cart nearby while we listen to the barker. He exhorts us to see India's Taj Mahal, walk the streets of Ceylon in Delhi, see native dancers and the white elephant of Burma and experience the exotic coochie coochie dance. But we're getting hungry since it's almost time for dinner. The last real ride that we took was under and over the sea. It took us on a submarine ride to Paris. We looked out the portholes and saw coral reefs, fishes, monsters, and sunken shipwrecks. Then we went up the Eiffel Tower in an elevator and saw Paris at night below us. Finally, we board a dirigible airship for the return journey to America. After passing through the terrific thunderstorm and lots of lightning over the Atlantic Ocean, we returned safely to St. Louis at dawn, passing over the Eads Bridge. By now we are really hungry. We walk through a replica of St. Lawrence's Gate at Drogda into the Irish village. We see replicas of Blarney Castle and Carmack's Cap Chapel peek at plays in Irish dances in a theater and see exhibits of Irish crafts such as linen, laces, and carpets. And of course, there is a cafe and a restaurant. We eat some tasty Irish stew in the old Irish House of Parliament and listen to Dublin's army band playing on the bandstand just outside. Finally, before leaving the pike, we walk around to the Triolian village. The dramatic mountains in the large village look spectacular and make us feel like we really are in Germany. We heard a man say. I just came back from the Tyrolean Alps in Germany. Two days later, I came here to the fair. I stopped dead in my tracks. I couldn't believe that I wasn't by some miracle again seeing the real thing. Dorothy Daniels Burke, The World Came to St. Louis. We only have a little money left for a souvenir and it is getting late. So we can't take a tram car ride through scenic mountain valleys to see the birthplace of Mozart. I would like to see the Oberammergau passion play but we are too late for that. But there is still lots to see and do. With free German concerts in the bandstand, restaurants selling German food specialties, 
and we get some free examples. And German peasants selling their wares in food fair souvenirs. Each of us buy a souvenir as it is late and we are about to go home. We end our day tired but satisfied. As we leave the pike, we pass by Remington's Cowboys statue. Even though it is late, mom and dad walk with us around the Grand Basin. Yeah, if you ride. To see the electrical illuminations. The palaces look like buildings in fairyland, and the reflected lights on the water are wonderful. Festival Hall and the Cascades look so majestic. As we head out the main entrance for our trolley ride back home, we take one last longing look at the night view of Festival Hall and the illuminated Cascades. We are filled with the wonders of the day, having seen many things from around the world that we've never seen before. Now, I sure wish I could have experienced the wonders of the Pike with Laura and her family. The Pike set a high mark in 1904 for its respectable entertainment, amazing attractions, and cultural displays. It showed visitors to the Louisiana Purchase Exposition the wonders of the world, giving them a sample and taste of places that only a few could visit. Today, there are only a few memories of the fair to keep those memories alive such as the statue of St. Louis and the art museum. These always make me think of the 1904 fair when I see them. This concludes the presentation. We'll take some questions now. David, uh, I've not been able to watch the uh, um, comments or anything. Uh, any, anybody type in any questions? Not so far, it looks like. Um... This was a very thorough walk up the pike. Okay. Charlotte Ellis did share that her grandfather did help build New York to the New North Pole, but that was more a comment than a question. Right. Uh, I'm going to change my view to the uh, speaker view up in the upper right when you put your mouse on the corner in the upper right. Um, you can go to speaker view, which will show the person that was last talking besides yourself uh, in a large view. And you can bring yourself off of mute uh, by clicking on the audio button down in the, uh, or the mute button down in the lower left of the Zoom screen. And if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and speak up with your questions. We did have one come in from Maggie Abbott. Was the ride through Hades supposed to be based on Dante's Inferno? That's a good question. Yes, it was based on Dante's Inferno and uh, it was used as an inspiration to you know, go down to descend into Hades, cross the river of death, et cetera. And on the video, The World's Greatest Fair, uh, there is a story that was written about uh, some little eight or 10 year old boy who got so scared, he came out of that and said, mama, mama, I'm so sorry I lost your ring. I took it out into the cornfield and lost it. Mama, I'm so sorry. We'll notice it, but in situations, he's calling the best pitch for. I thought Any you other and question? Holly were just fantastic. Thank you so much for this presentation. I really learned a lot. I agree, it was wonderful. Mike, what was the um, Ozark shooting uh, exhibit about? Hunting in the Ozarks was basically a target shooting gallery using blanks with little moving animals that go back and forth, much like you see on today's Midway. I think okay. it was sponsored by Remington. Remington also had a real shooting gallery out near the Palace of Forestry Fish and Game, where Missouri had an exhibit of some of their animals in cages. And, uh, you know, they had a shooting gallery with targets that were set up, you know, 25 yards or something away from the shooter, again, uh, looking to sell their rifles and uh, bullets. 
Okay. I never had heard of that before. That was a new one. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Could you win a prize maybe if you, you know, got. I don't know. <laughs> so newspaper uh, advertisements that would say, oh, uh, we're selling the gun that you could use at uh, hunting the Ozarks. Uh, oh, yeah. And there was a pie cat, like there's a style of hat that they were marketing as a pie cat. Probably <laughs> <the> mountain lion. <laughs> uh, Holly, I noticed right over your shoulder on your view of the pike, you can see a close up of one of the arc lights that are hanging from the towers that went, went down the center of the pike. Uh, that's probably the closest view I've ever seen of one. Now, keep in mind uh, the Pike Street went right down the middle of that street between Lindell and Forest Park Parkway, where all of those houses, mansions were built after the fair. And the two sides of the street were about 150 feet and 250 feet with that 90 foot street in the middle that went right down the middle of all those lots, which are, if you look at uh, Google Maps or Google Earth, you can see that those lots aren't very wide, but they are very deep, you know, going way back. Um, with a uh, Google Earth overlay, you can see which exhibits were where and whose house is on what address and uh, what exhibit their house was built on top of. Hagenbeck's Animal Circus, 10 cents. I think that's what you said. Uh, yes, I think it was 10 cents to go in and look at the larger exhibits where they had a lot of different animals from lions, tigers, bears, and dogs all in one large area. But I think to go see some of the other shows like the elephant going down the slide or the trained wild animals, there was an additional admission charge. Um, somebody asked if this will be recorded and be available for viewing again. The answer is yes. Uh, if my recording or David's recording is working good, uh, it will be saved and put out on the web and uh, members will be getting an email on that, hopefully within the next week on how they can go see the February meeting, which was World's Fair Oddities, and also uh, last month's meeting from Candace Bergen about, or Candace uh, O'Connor about, uh, pardon me, Candace, if you're on, uh, Candace O'Connor about uh, uh, Wash U in the Fair. We have another question. Uh, let's see. Surprised to see an incubator exhibit for premature babies. Was there a new medicine that they wanted to show or was the purpose for pregnant women who were traveling to the fair? There's a whole book that's been writ written about the baby incubators and the science of uh, care for infants. Um, the medical community was slow to accept in 1900, 1904, newfangled techniques for treating people. They did what they could. And basically if an infant wasn't thriving, they sent him home, him or her home. Uh, medicine and the development of incubators uh, was just coming along and they didn't, nobody wanted to show them. So they ended up not only at St. Louis Fair, but I think also the Buffalo Fair in 1901, being on the entertainment districts and showing how to care for them. During the first month or two of operation at St. Louis, the infant survival rate wasn't as good as they hoped. And they began to figure out that allowing people to come up to the railing and look at the little babies probably wasn't the best thing for the babies. And they put up a large glass and there were some letters that went back and forth. There was an article in the uh, Post-Dispatch based on the book about a year ago uh, about how that was a real scandal. And, you know, because our fair was going for the cheapest vendor to show the incubators, we weren't doing what was best for the babies, et cetera. But they put the glass up, they improved their techniques of infant care and preserving sanitary conditions when they could. And guess what? The survival rate went up. 
And there's a story about some people who uh, saw a little infant that was there and they came back to the fair over the course of oh, five or six weeks and they ended up adopting that baby and uh, they called him Francis after David R. Mike, yeah. it's, what I read on this topic pretty recently was that when the babies began to not thrive, um, voices started talking and eventually the overseering of the incubator concession was transferred to a different doctor who was perhaps more aware of the, I don't know, germs and so forth. And uh, it was under his tutelage that the babies began to thrive. But I also read about the police officer who uh, with his wife um, went in and fell in love with this little baby and adopted her. If you want to find that article that was published about a year and a half or so ago, year to year and a half, go to the uh, newspaper website, STL Today, and do a search for 1904 World's Fair Baby Incubators, and you'll probably find that article. We have a couple of questions about Hales firefighters. Were they ever needed to assist with the fire on the pike? And did they get pulled into help when the Missouri building was burning? Um, I There were a couple of minor fires on the pike. Uh, I don't know that Hales firefighters responded. The uh, Fires tended to be late in the evenings after the you know larger concessions were starting to shut down. And of course, the big Missouri fire, uh, Missouri building fire took place, I think, around 11 or 12 o'clock at night. Uh, and that was halfway across the fairgrounds. The bigger Pike fire was after closing day. I don't know if it was like a few days. There was a newspaper article and an image of what all burned. Right. I, I don't think it destroyed any of the concessions, but moderate damage was done to two or three of the concessions close to each other. December 4th or 5th or something like that, I think. The Jefferson Guard would also sometimes help with uh, putting out fires uh, on the yeah. fire. Close enough to threaten the Palace of Mines and Metallurgy, the concatenated House of Hoo-Hoo burned to the ground with great loss of feline life. And I, I don't know who responded to that, but the, um, the people in the nearby Texas pavilion grabbed sheets off the beds and began taking out their treasures from Texas. Texas had sent some seriously valuable artifacts from Texas history and they hauled them out because there was a fear that the nearby Texas pavilion was going to catch. And there was also a fear that mines and metallurgy was going to catch, but neither of them did. Didn't the Hoo Hoo House get uh, rebuilt? Yes, it did in extremely fast time. These carpenters put it up in less than 30 days. I mean, it was gone. They put it up in less than 30 days, replacing all, I think there was 103 samples of indigenous American wood that was made into the new house of Hoo Hoo.
Um, just a little note for everybody. I see that uh, new member Ike is an hour uh, typed a little thing that if anybody is still looking for a frame for the 1904 World's Fair aerial view that was sent to members uh, about four or five months ago, Hobby Lobby has a black wood and glass 36 by 11 by three quarters frame that is normally $50, but they're running it at half off right now. Uh, that's a pretty good price. And of course, uh, we also made that uh, lithograph, that print to perfectly fit into a frame from Michael's that you can usually uh, get a Michael's coupon for half off. And you can probably get them, uh, and it's a plastic frame with a flexible layer of uh, thin plexiglass on it for around 15 or $16. So if you haven't framed yours yet, uh, there's a couple of good opportunities. We have a question that's probably into your research as you prepared this. Um, Pat Din asked, since there was so much to see on the pike, could one see all of it in one day? Uh, I know your, your characters didn't seem to think so. <laughs> Uh, some of the things on the pike are actually hard to find information about. Uh, the circle swing, I uh, can't find mention of it in the newspaper. Uh, Mike found it uh, mentioned only one place. Uh, the, there was a palmistry temple that you don't hear much about. I saw like one, th a couple of things on, uh, in newspapers. Uh, couldn't find much about the Clarksville cider, just like that it was there and had multiple stands. Uh, of, um, yeah. I think they did a, a good job and added up that if you did all of the paid admissions on the Pike and paid the extra, like inside of Hagenbeck's or some of the other places, like, uh, in the Tyrolean Alps, there was a little tram ride that you could go on to see little dioramas of little uh, models of cities in Germany up in the mountains and stuff. That was like 10 cents. Uh, you know, if you added that all up, I think the cost was between 25 and $30. I would assume that included the Ferris wheel and the Boer War, which were down on Skinker. And uh, the Boer War, I think, was like a two-hour extravaganza. So if you took in one of those shows, you know, that would really eat into the available time during your day. And keep in mind, a lot of these places like the Boer War was probably more than a half mile from the rest of the pike. There's a lot of stereoscope views of the Boer War. It has like a picture of their parade and... <coughs> scenes. One of the uh, interesting things I learned, and I may write an article on someday about the pike, if you go back and look at that April 30th, 1903 uh, cover, uh, which I can uh, call up and show you again, uh, and I'll try to work on that, um, that uh, they hadn't settled yet where the pike was going to be. I think they were looking at putting it along uh, skinker uh, and just have entertainments on either side. They had signed a contract to get the Ferris wheel down here. But uh, the tract of land called the Caitlin track between Lindell and Forest Park Parkway and from De Bolivar out to Washington University wasn't uh, acquired until the middle or fall of 1903. And uh, I'm sharing my screen to be able to show you this. Uh, everyone has probably seen that uh, poster of the fair with uh, nice colored buildings and stuff like that. Uh, this kind of shows a little bit of the same thing where the pike basically went along the lower right here. And it's kind of hard to see, but if you come up along here I can't zoom in uh, much more on this. Maybe I can zoom in a little bit more on this uh, and show you that it actually shows some little Indian teepees and things like that. 
up here along Skinker. No Ferris wheel. That contract wasn't signed yet. But I'm thinking that they may be planned on the pike being along here until they got that tract of land right by the entrance, which was their desires. And I think the people that own that land uh, just held out for a higher price. And once they got that squared away in the fall of 1903, they had all these contracts from all these concessionaires wanting to build their things. And they did some pretty rapid slicing and dicing of the uh, road, got the utilities put in and let people start building and got everything hooked up. And about half of the Pike concessions were open on opening day, which means about half of them weren't. They didn't open up until sometime in May, but by the end of May, everything was pretty much open, including the Ferris wheel. Any other questions or uh, more stuff in depth? Uh, Larry has a question. He's, he's gone a different, slightly different direction. Most fairs had a midway, which the Pike represented that would have some tawdry attractions. Any awareness of off the books attractions in the late evening? Um, that's a good question. I believe that the fair managers with the board of lady managers looking over their shoulder was very much scrutinizing all of the concessions to make sure that there was all above level and not tawdry or uh, sideshow type things. Uh, I've heard that there was an area north of the fairgrounds along to Bolivar, and I forgot what it was called, uh, a nickname for it, where there were some of the sideshow attractions where that guy with the eight foot beard or however long his beard was, and some of the other sideshow attractions might have been located near the uh, trolley car loops and the Wabash station right outside the fairgrounds. I've not read too much about those, though. Holly, have you found anything on that? Uh, not too much, no. OK. Well, one last call for any questions or inputs. Well, with that, I'm going to hopefully 